reflection is transform an experience into knowledge because experience alone doesn't guarantee that you're going to learn um you know why am i doing what i'm doing you know you're really questioning yourself you know we grow in the direction that we ask questions a lot of barriers to good players whereas in the uk you might be from the council estate or you might have gone to private school it doesn't matter if you're a top player the club is going to do whatever they can to get you there you know why am i doing what i'm doing you know you're really questioning yourself Martin Dixon, welcome to the Christy Scanlon podcast. Um, my first question, Martin, is describe your coaching journey. How did you get into coaching and how did you become an academic in terms of where you're at now at the moment? Yeah, I think I got into coaching. It was, it was quite interesting, um, quite an unusual way, really. Um, I got into coaching just because I wanted to travel. Um, you know, that was something that, you know, I'd just always been, been on my mind and I'd started a, a degree, started studying um, sport and exercise science, and I'd read somewhere that you could go and coach in America um, for the summer. You know, as a lot of a lot of kind of sports coaching and sports science students have done. Um, so yeah, I, I really just got into coaching so that I could go and do that and just go and you know spend the spend the summers traveling. Um, didn't really have a clue about coaching um, for the company at the time. You just needed your level one, so. Um, fortunately, the you know the university at the time, they were subsidising a lot of coaching awards. So I just had to do a bit of volunteer work, and they would pay for the level one. And um, you know, I worked at a local leisure centre. Um, I wouldn't call it coaching. You know, I was just kind of put some cones out and kept an eye on the kids. So that wasn't really much coaching, but it was what I needed to do um, to get me out to America. Um, so yeah, I did that. Um, my first real coaching experience was working with kind of five and six year olds in Alabama um, so probably not your usual route um, and I didn't really have a clue what I was doing I was kind of thrown in at the deep end because not only is it a new job for me and I wasn't that experienced obviously a completely different different culture um, so it's a bit of a sink or swim um, a bit of a sink or swim moment um, so yeah we did that and um, you know I was quite fortunate to work in the in the deep south in America um, in the northeast um, came back out the, a year later and worked in the, in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, and that's quite an interesting link because I ended up there, you know, quite a few years later on and, and moving out there permanently. Um, so I really enjoyed that great experience coming out to the States in the summer and, and coaching. And, you know, I got back to university um, and I thought, oh, can I do this here? Um, did a bit of research and you know, you can get paid more as a coach than you could working behind a bar or stacking shelves or your, your other student jobs. And, you know, and of course it was, it was relevant to the degree. So um, did a bit of research and ended up getting in contact with a company called Soccer Stars UK. Um, they're quite well known around uh, Derbyshire and, and, and parts of Staffordshire doing a lot of after school clubs and the holiday courses and, and that type of thing. Um, and that was a really important uh, developmental process for me, Christy, because they were that company was run at the time by, and, and I think still is by uh, Darren Wassell and Pat Lyons, who manage Derby County's academy now. Um, and Darren had even he's even taken the first team actually, uh, took us to the playoffs. Um, so learning under those two, um, and a colleague Kevin Nicholson who was there at the time, he's gone on to do great things. He's he's now a, a coach educator at Everton. Um, so being able to learn under those three was incredible. Um, and looking back, I didn't realise how impactful that was. And Soccer Stars had a great model um, of, of player development, which was based around, um, you know, 1v1, ball manipulation, small side of games and shooting. Um, and really that's stuff that I've taken with me um, ever since. So in terms of your academic profile then, Martin, so you, you started coaching, you've got a taste for it, you've got the bug for it. How did your academic profile then develop into the academic you are now? Yeah, um, I think I think I, I kind of gradually grew into the academic side and away from more like the professional sports coaching side. Um, so I'll just I'll give a bit more in terms of that story because it is it is relevant. Um, that one one day out of the blue, you know, I've been working at the soccer stars for a couple of years, and I was doing some part time lecturing at, a, at an FE college, um, and I got a call from the assistant academy manager at, at, at Derby. Gareth Prosser um, and he just asked me if I wanted to come in and, and have a trial with them as an academy coach and I had no idea about this I had no idea you know my colleague Kevin had, had recommended me um, to Derby and I went in 
um, I didn't think I was anywhere near that level, to be honest, at the time. You know, I was, I'd just done the after school clubs and the holiday stuff. I was starting my UEFA B, um, but I ended up getting a job part time at Derby, which was, which was brilliant. You know, as my club that I'd supported all my life, uh, growing up watching um, some of the ex players, you know, work in there and being around the club. It was, it was amazing. Um, so I, I was there for a bit um, and then I got the opportunity to, to go to uh, a place called Hartbury College down in Gloucestershire. Um, I had a scholarship there to basically go and coach their university teams um, and, and study a master's. And that was when I probably grew more into the academic side as well as, as a, as a practising coach. Was there any challenges within that process? Was there anything around maybe the micro politics of soccer or, fo uh, or football where you've had to really think differently about coaching and the nature of coaching as a profession? Yeah, I think absolutely. I mean, it, it sounds linear, but obviously there's a lot of, there's a lot of challenges in there. Um, you know, for example, at, at Derby, um, and I, I think a lot of people could relate to this, being in a, an academy background and not having a, a professional playing background myself. Um, I think that um, you, have to, you have to be very aware of the other skills that you've got and what you can contribute because you've not got that kind of um, that, that gravitas or that influence that you'd have from being an ex-player. Um, maybe, I didn't think of it at the time, but maybe a bit of imposter syndrome. Because I'm going into, I was never that level as a player, and all of a sudden I'm developing players of that level, and we're going away to Manchester United or Liverpool or or wherever, and, and playing against their kids. And this was an environment that I was never part of. Um, so I think that was that was quite challenging. I mean, a wonderful learning experience, um, you know, at, at the time, but um, also quite challenging. You've got ex pro, ex international professionals, um, and then it was a bit like as a 23, 24 year old who's just who's who's experienced in that sense is limited, you know, what am I bringing to the table? So that was a really steep learning curve. Um, and even though, even though it was academy level, it was, I, I did feel quite a bit of pressure to, to get a team performing. Um, and it was, you know, I was only working with kind of like the under 10s, but to get a team performing. And I remember the big games, like we play against Nottingham Forest under 10s, but because it was almost like that local thing, the parents would be down there. It was really intense, you know, and, um, especially being attached to the club emotionally as a, as a fan, you know, previously, um, I felt quite a bit of pressure, um, you know, to get the team playing as well as, as well as developing the players. Two key terms that you said uh, then was pressure. So did you put pressure on yourself? Uh, two questions here, Martin. Did you put pressure on yourself or was it the organisation uh, uh, and, and the people involved within that organisation? And imposter syndrome, how would you deal with that as a young coach going into those environments? Two big oh, questions. I do apologise. Yeah, I'll try it. So I'll try we'll start it. with the first one. We'll start with the first one. So you said pressure. Was that internally yeah. or externally? Mostly internal, yeah. I, I think not, not the organisation. They didn't put pressure on me at all. I think that... At the time, we had a really forward-thinking academy director um, called Kevin Thelwell, who's now, I think, head of football at Everton. Um, and he was wonderful. Um, and Gareth Prosser, who's the assistant academy manager, those guys taught me a lot. And I learned a lot from the coaches there as well. So um, they were very forward-thinking. They were more developmentally focused. Um, you know, they wanted the players to, to relax and, and develop in a, in a good environment. Um, but it was more around the academy coaching um environment generally i think and obviously you had a lot of commitment from parents like we hardly had any kids actually from derby they were coming in from birmingham from leicester so you had these kids traveling in like three times a week you know probably you know the best kids in their school best kids in their area uh, and i'm now responsible for their for their development so i think i think it was mostly um internal pressure um, to do that and, and certainly if I had my time again and, and going back to it I'd be much more relaxed around it mm. you know but I think I put a lot of pressure on myself there just because I was new to that as you say and I guess the imposter syndrome thing I think that's that's linked into it because if I'd been around that environment more as a youngster or perhaps if I'd have played at a higher level then maybe I wouldn't have had that and you know I'd be able to cope with it a bit better um, I think dealing with it is as, as a young coach is understanding that whilst you've got a lot to learn, you've also got a lot to contribute. But it's working out what that is. 
how can you add value because you can't add it as in, you know in terms of your playing background um but what you can do is you know perhaps bring in for me you know a bit of that academic experience you know one of my main subjects at university was skill acquisition most of learning something that i teach now so how do we actually develop skills you know across different whether it's sports environments so i had a lot of knowledge there you know what's you know what's the best way or what's a good way of giving feedback what's a really effective way of designing a practice so that was a way that i could add value so i think i think dealing with it is is working out and valuing what you've got to contribute uh, you know and bring to the table i'm not sure if i was ever um inauthentic in terms of values but yeah definitely probably act in a certain way or putting on a bit of a front that you know you wouldn't usually have um you know and, and, and i go back to that experience i had with with soccer stars i'm working with kids after school and then kids the same age at the academy and i'm doing something quite different i'm treating the kids quite differently i'm treating them a bit more as um rightly or wrongly well wrongly you know i'm treating them more as young adults you know more as performers um, so yeah, certainly I think ways that I would interact with players um, was was very different in terms of just just picking up on that culture and um, how you should be. I mean, even even things that come down to if you look at most coaches, they even wear the same even wear the same boots, you know. Um, so yeah, there's there's definitely like that little language and that little culture that you that you pick up on. Um, but at the same time, as you say, you have got to be authentic. You can only be you've got to be you. I mean. And, and I think that's a challenge in coaching now because there's so many, there's so much knowledge out there, you know, mm. going on YouTube, following people on Twitter, LinkedIn and reading people's books. There's just so much out there and there isn't, there isn't one blueprint to it. You know, sometimes I've read a book and I thought, okay, I want to be more like that. Um, I got really into, like most of us do in England, I got really into like the Dutch um, system of player development and playing. Um, you know, four three three, playing this expansive game and stuff, and then I went down to to Hartbury College and I was working with the second team there, and I thought, okay, I'm going to get them playing like this. And I wasn't used to university football, you know, and um, there were so many turnovers, and it was very physical, and you know, and it, it didn't work at all. And within a game, I had to change it and just think about, you know, what have I got here? What are my players? What has my team got? Um, and work with that rather than me thinking oh, I've got to try and um, take from this coach that I've learned about from this other coach that I've learned about and try and impose that because um, that wasn't, it wasn't appropriate for that situation. So yeah, that, that authenticity is something that I just think comes with experience. And, and because, because there's so much knowledge out there. Um, but if we even look at top coaches, they all do things a different way. Like nobody's exactly the same. So um, you can take little bits from people, but um, you know, you've got to be you because even if being you isn't isn't being the best coach, it's going to be better than trying to be someone else. So many different avenues that we can learn. You mentioned all those social media platforms and the experiences people might get. Do you think sometimes coaching can be overcomplicated? Definitely, definitely. And I think a big skill is what information do you ignore? Um, you know, I'm on I'm on LinkedIn and I often get these things around coaching or match analysis. Um, and it's like, there's just too much out there for me to be able to implement into my practice. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think, I think a big, a big skill is having an understanding of, you know, what's going to add value to me um, versus what's going to um, perhaps distract. And you might get into the idea of that, that butterfly coaching where I'm starting to pick up little bits of, of everything, you know, from this person, I'm, I'm bringing in um, aspects of this, of this discipline. Um, and that's where I think, the reflective practice is, you know, the reflection is really important because that's learning about yourself. Um, and you mentioned authenticity, Christy, and, you know, through reflection, we can perhaps have a bit more of that because we can generate more self-insight. We can generate more self-awareness. You know, what, what am I about as a coach? Um, and then just be selective in terms of what knowledge is going to add to that and contribute to that. Do you think that there needs to be a bit more of a awareness of the culture of football itself and how it might impact those involved. Yeah, absolutely. I, th I think that you are seeing some changes, even if it's very gradually. Um, but now, at least, it's a conversation that's being had, particularly around the exit strategies. And, you know, it was definitely the hardest thing I had to do was, was releasing players. Um, and this was, this was youngsters. And I don't know if this makes it easier or worse because, you know, you're releasing somebody who's 9, 10, 11. Um, and it's not just 
the fact that it's you know they want to play at that level but it's also they've got friends there and it's become part of their life they spend a lot of time there in that yeah. environment so you know releasing players and that was something that always um always worried me you know and it was a conversation even if i didn't agree with the decision i was one that had to go in the room and talk to the parents and you know and, and the players that was very difficult um so i think that even at younger levels let alone at you know 16 or 18 when you think you could have a chance of of making a profession out of it and making a living out of it so it's i, I think it, the clubs have got a responsibility mm. you know we the, you know there's there's a, the statistics around there about um how many players enter an academy or a, or a professional club how many of them are going to actually make a first team appearance very few um so then what are we doing with the rest of it are we only operating for that one percent we do we only exist for that one percent so i think it comes down to having a, a broader um, perspective and broader mission um you know and i would say that when i since i left derby funnily enough full circle um Darren Wassell had worked with at Soccer Stars has now become the academy manager. And he did, I remember him saying that they have a responsibility to make sure that everyone who comes through the door um, enjoys it, you know, and just enjoys the experience of being there. So I think it comes down to those clubs having a bigger mission and not just obviously promoting players to the first team as your main goal or being able to sell players to, to keep the club afloat. Um, but it's got to be bigger than that. It's got to be bigger than that. It's, it, it's got to have a... Um, we've got to have a bigger mission and then it's up to the coaches to actually put that into practice. The UK, America, in terms of coaching sport in general, what are the differences? Is there anything um, that is different that you've experienced? First of all, I have to say that, um, you know, considering this question, it is, it's an interesting one, but it's, it, because the US is obviously such a, not just a big country in terms of size, but in terms of the different cultures. So I can't really speak to, you know, what they're doing in, in Texas or, or, or New York or, or Hawaii. You know, my experience is in, in the San Francisco Bay Area and in soccer, you know, football and in particularly in the men's and the boys game. Um, but, yeah, I, I think there are probably some national trends that, that I could mention as well. And I think, I think obviously collegiate sport um, and high school sport is something that's, that's very different. Um, there's much more emphasis on that. It's given a much bigger priority. Um, and then that also has knock-on effects developmentally um, as well. Um, and I think it's a great thing in and of itself. I, you know, I think in the UK, we quite admire this, you know, the collegiate sport in the States because, you know, when we're at university, maybe you just get one man and his dog turn up to watch a game, whereas here you might get 60,000 people and it's on TV, mm. um, particularly in the you know, not not necessarily in, in in soccer, but maybe in in you know the American football or, or basketball. But you know, that's that has an um, an impact on on development as well. Um, I think the results and standings, uh, it, whilst it can be an issue in the UK, it's much bigger here at a much younger age. Um, you know, league position, trophies. People talk about winning percentages, even at youth level. Uh, you know, and at high school level, you know, you're working with 14, 15 year olds um, and the coaches and, you know, the coaches, to be fair, I mean, this is it's kind of the pressures that they experience because they're they're expected to have to, to finish in, in a place that can qualify them for the school for playoffs. Um, you know, they're expected to have certain win percentages or expected to beat certain teams. So that obviously changes then how they go about their coaching. And a lot of those high school coaches will also work in a club. Um, so it has a big knock on effect that it's even more so than, than, than in England, it's too results based and too um, outcome driven um, at an early age. Um, so that's a big one. Um, you know, I, I think that we have something here which is really damaging um, called, which is called the pay to play culture. Um, so at a club, for example, just like your normal club you know, the equivalent of a Sunday league under 12s team in England, you know, here where I am now in this area, you would, you know, the parents would be paying 1,000, maybe 2,000 a season. You know, there are two seasons a year. So you might be paying, you know, two, three thousand dollars a season to get your player into the club. And it's not even a, a particularly high level, right? It's, you know, it's just a grassroots recreational level. Um, you know, and that's the, the positive of that is it gives coaches a lot of work. So, you know, this is something I'd come back to is 
professionalization of coaching is very different in, in, in both countries. Um, and there are more opportunities to work as a coach here, a, a variety of levels, you know, not just at the elite level. You know, you could be a full time coach working at a recreational level. Um, but that's because of this pay to play. Um, whereas for us, you know, for, I remember for me, it was like I paid two pounds a week in, in <laughs> subs and then, and then that would be it. Right. So the, but these, these are paying thousands because it is a business. You know, there are leagues and tournaments, organizations that are charging a lot of money for your team to be able to enter and compete. And if you don't do it, it's very difficult to develop because that's what the best clubs are doing. You know, and the best clubs are charging the most money. Now, the huge problem that they've got here is that the top players are often from immigrant families, from um, less affluent areas. Um, but these, the top clubs who are obviously paying more money to get better coaches, you know, they can, they can charge more so they can pay better coaches. Um, you know, they're not, they're not recruiting those players are in completely different areas. So mm. they're at, it's actually a system that is excluding the best talent in the country. Um, and sometimes I hear things like, you know, the USA will win a World Cup, you know, the US men's team will win a World Cup in the next 20 years or something. Um, you know, I actually think the US, I'm surprised at how good they are now, considering what I see here developmentally, when you compare that to what's some of the improvements that have gone on in England, um, you know, and obviously, you know, the European countries in South America and Africa. Um, I'm kind of surprised that they're as good as they are um, because there are, some, there are a lot of barriers to good players. Whereas in the UK, you might be from the council estate or you might have gone to private school. It doesn't matter if you're a top player, the club is going to do whatever they can to get you there and you don't have to pay any money to do it. So I think that that has a, a big impact on, on the culture um, and also on, on kind of coach uh, behaviour. Can I ask you about the emphasis on the educational system, the university system? So we see a lot of scholarships and opportunities for those that are very talented within sport to go to university. Different to maybe the UK, I know we have a scholarship system here. I get the impression, and, and again tell me if I'm wrong, that there's more emphasis on education, higher education, sport and that kind of alignment between between the two there in comparison to maybe the UK. Am I, am I right or wrong? Uh, you're right. And it's, you know what, it's got, it's got some strengths and weaknesses. You know, there are some, um, there's some great things that have come out of it. I mean, you know, combining the athletics, you know, athletics here is sport, you know, it's not track and field, you know, so combining what they call athletics um, and academics is, you know, is, is a wonderful thing. Um, and, the, you know, the, a lot of the athletes, it's really hard. It's, it's really difficult. You know, some of them might be on a full scholarship or a partial scholarship which sounds great, but you know, when you're traveling and you've got a flight of games and you've got a busy schedule and you've got to study full time, I know that the athletes work very hard. And when you're talking about things like player care, it's a similar issue here. Um, mm -hmm. I think there's a bit more support in place here, you know, for, for those athletes. Um, so it's a great thing, you know, and, the, and the, the, you know, the athletes have got to maintain their grade point average. So they've still got to make sure they're keeping up with their, with their classes and, and performing um in the classroom as well as as well as on the field so there's there's pressure for them but it's you know the academic side is certainly not neglected um there's a really interesting um i guess rule or policy here called title nine um, which is also a wonderful thing so that's it's it's about equity and amongst other things states that any investment into male sports has to be equal in female sports Right. Um, and this might also explain why, you know, the women's football, women's soccer is so big here, because if the universities are putting loads of money into, you know, their American football team, which has a massive roster, then it also has to put equal amounts of, of funding into into women's sport. So obviously that goes into it goes into volleyball. It goes into maybe women's basketball, soccer, tennis. So the the, the athletic programs for both males and females are you know are really well funded. So it's a great thing. And, and also, as I say, as a coach, you've now got more employment opportunities. There are very few in the UK or in Europe employment opportunities as a, as a, as a coach at a higher education institution. You know, you, there might be some, some might be combined with teaching. You know, here, um, you know, that's a full time permanent job. Your profession is an academic. You are, um, you know, you publish academic articles. You you write academic books. How do you apply um, 
academic work into your coaching profession? Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a great question. So, so my, my current role, my main job is um, I'm a lecturer in kinesiology uh, at San Francisco State University. Um, and I mostly teach motor learning and skill acquisition, um, which is something that I love. It's something that I've taught, you know, at, at other universities back in the UK. And obviously it lends itself very well to coaching because fundamentally that's about, you know, there's a, there's a few key concepts, but really it's about instructional behaviours. So how do we most effectively give feedback and demonstration? Um, also, when should we refrain from doing that and let them learn just, just through the exercise? So it's about instructional behaviors and it's about practice design. So of course that, that links into my coaching, you know, almost seamlessly, right? I'm thinking about, you know, I talk about this with students every week uh, and I get to work on this with the players. Um, and also I do some coach education here at the university as well. So yeah, that for me, it links nicely, you know, and, and I get to use that, that knowledge, you know, through the research, um, see if it actually works in my coaching and obviously sometimes it doesn't because you know this is really the interesting thing with with academic researchers the studies have been conducted in a very specific setting with a specific sample or group of people and then you apply that to your coaching where your environment is completely different um, and it's not just about skill acquisition motor learning it's also about getting players attention motivating them you know making sure that they you know, feel part of the team, you know, you've got good relationships with them and with, and with, the, with the parents and whatnot. So, yeah, there's, there's, some, there's some barriers. Um, and I also bring it the other way, like, you know, my coaching informs what I do as a teacher. You know, I try and get people out of the classroom onto the field, you know. Um, so they, they both link in really nicely. Um, where I've definitely seen challenges is um, trying to get those concepts across to, to coaches. Um, you know, so my role at the club as, as technical director, one of the things was coach education and trying to implement um, our principles as a club. Um, and this was a really difficult balance. You know, we're trying to implement our DNA, you know, what we want every coach to be able to do, what we want every team to be able to do um, and what a, a player should look like at our club. Um, but also we want to ensure that the coaches have autonomy as well. You know, because that's the fun of being a coach. You know, I've got to be able to, you know, choose my formation and do what I want to practice this week. Um, so it was a, you know, a, a quite an interesting balance. You know, in talking to the coaches about some of these concepts like practice variability, you know, this is something that is really key. Talking about implicit learning, so you know, a player learning through an exercise or through your session rather than by mouth, rather than you telling them exactly what to do and through that expert instruction um, and some of these ideas that you know quite quite new to people and obviously the terminology um, you know that I might have to might have to change so yeah there's definitely some challenges there in, in getting that 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 research into into practice um, you know and I, I think it also comes back to the back to that culture aspect and um, you know when I was working in the UK I'd go on coach education courses um, and I would see quite a big resistance to academia. Now, I know things are changing, and I think that the, um, for those that are involved in, in football, you know, the youth modules have been uh, kind of a breath of fresh air because they're actually teaching coaches, you know, how to coach and more of the psychology of the game and not just the, the X's and O's that the, the old, you know, A and B licenses did. Um, you know, obviously you need, you need both elements. Um, but yeah, I, I would notice quite a lot of resistance to any academic ideas. And I even, I can remember having a conversation with a colleague of mine and we're both sports coaches, but also sports coach and academics. And he told me that he just wouldn't, when he was on a coach education course with the FA, he wouldn't say what he did for a living. He didn't want them to know that he was a lecturer because people would treat him differently. Wow. You know, um, you know, there'd be resistance to it. Um, and, and I think not just for, for us as a lecturers, which, which is a shame because you've got somebody there who's got years of experience and a lot of knowledge, whether it's theoretical or it's come from research um, and even that might be useful. You know, a course is only as good as the people that are on it, you know, not just the coach educator or the tutor, it's, it's the group. So it was a shame because he's now withholding all of that experience and all that knowledge. Um, but actually, I, I want to come back to this idea of... Um, you know, the, the barriers, you know, between, between research and practice. I remember being on a course, you know, it was an FA course in the UK and um, 
there was this thing that, that had happened where some of the sports, there were sports science students on the course who were also coaching academies, you know, and they'd been kind of mocked a few times for being, you know, for being squares or for being, you know, um, you know, I guess overly intellectualizing football or something. Um, and then one day there was a coach, it was a, he was a great coach. He was actually working at one of the top clubs in the country. Um, um, and he brought up this idea. He said, he said, all right, you know, at, at such and such a club, we use something called random varied practice. And he started talking about it in the group. And the coach educator just said to him, bloody students. You know, and the groups laughed and they've laughed at him and then he's kind of laughed along with it. Um, and that was how, you know, that, that, I guess, an academic approach to it was treated on the course. And I was sat there thinking what he's just said was probably the most important thing that I've heard on the course mm. regarding, regarding skill acquisition, regarding player development. And he's just kind of been ridiculed for it. And I think because perhaps because that, that tutor maybe wasn't comfortable in, with that language himself. So I, th I think, it, you know, it comes from both sides. You know, we've got a from the academics or from sports science students, we've got to perhaps package it in a way which is more accessible. Um, but then also for the for the coach educators and, and you know for people in the game to be a bit more receptive to it, you know, and instead that he could have said to him rather than saying, "Oh, bloody students, what do you know?" Mm. Um, you know, you know all this academics, all this science. Instead of saying that, he could have said, "You know, why don't you tell us a bit more about that?" You know, how would that look in practice? So I think part of it was there's a bit of a resistance to it, and maybe it was about being that person not being secure in their own knowledge or not being familiar with the terminology or um, you know, I, I'm not sure, but at, at, at that moment, you know, he put the coach down. So I've, I've noticed quite a few things like that. Um, and I think the responsibility for bridging that gap comes from both sides, a research article, right? So, you know, that might be relevant to coaching, you know, we have to make sure that it's, um, that it goes off to a, to a good journal. And then the editors and the reviewers might say, you know, I want you to talk more about this theory or, you know, you're kind of forced to use um, a certain type of language which isn't really accessible to to most coaches so there's there's an issue from both sides there's an issue from um, the research the academic side that we've got to make our work more accessible um, both in terms of you know can coaches you know get access to it is it on mm. is it on platforms that they can reach they're not going to pay to subscribe to a journal um, and then also making sure the language is accept is accessible as well that's as i say that's challenging because we're judged as academics more on um the impact factor of the journal and therefore it's got to be um you know it's got to be attached to perhaps more of an abstract theory um which i understand in terms of you know making sure a study is rigorous and that it adds you know it adds to the literature um but also we have to ask ourselves what's the purpose of this why am i writing this article is it just so that another 50 academics around the world we you know we just read each other's papers um or do we actually want this to get into coaching practice and, and help people mm. you know and, and i think a lot of coaching research can be a bit preachy as well um and i've done this i actually wrote i actually wrote a paper a few years ago and i sent it to a colleague of mine to to review and i'd use the phrase you know based on our findings i used the phrase oh so you know coaches should do this and, and he replied to me why should they um and I thought that was, that, was, that was really good feedback. Just because I found something with one group of coaches doesn't mean that all coaches should do, you know, they should use reflective practice in this way or they should, you know, give feedback in this way. So I started to change that and I've actually done a control and F through all of my documents and removed the word should because it's not for me to tell coaches what they should do. My responsibility is to, to give something that's useful, right? A, coaches you might find this useful and, and package it in a way that's access, is accessible for them um, so we've certainly got our responsibility from the academic side um, and it's really tough you know christy because we put things you can put things on linkedin and twitter um, but then if you do that you just get the headline of the study and you don't get the nuance of the study so maybe there's a certain way of practicing a certain drill or something and it's been really effective <clears throat> so a coach sees that and then they go and use it but what you've not said is well it was effective but only with these players at this age at this level in this particular setting um, and maybe it's not applicable to to what you're doing because your environment's completely different so um it's challenging but you know we've got to do we've got responsibility from the academic side 
but also coach education. Um, the coaches have got a responsibility as well to get more in touch with evidence-based practices, not just doing things for the sake of it, not just doing things because that's how I was taught or because that's how the club does it or because I just want to put on a practice tonight and get through the session. You know, is it actually based in evidence? Is there anything out there that says this actually works? Uh, <clears throat> you know, and I think I think we've seen, we've definitely seen massive progress towards that because um partly because of the P, which I know has got its pros and cons, but one of the pros is that um, sports science has become more embedded, you know, throughout clubs now, you know, because it's got to be, there's got to be more evidence-based practices. And there's got to be people from different backgrounds now contributing um, towards, uh, towards academies and towards, you know, de development of players. You, reflective practice is really key within that process. Why is it important and how does it benefit coaches in terms of the reflective process? Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, it's, it's kind of a buzzword as well. You know, you just hear people, you know, are reflected on this. And you know, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of different definitions or meanings. Um, essentially, for me, reflection is transforming experience into knowledge. Because experience alone doesn't guarantee that you're going to learn. You know, we might, you might see somebody who's just been doing the same thing for years, making the same mistakes for years. They're not really growing, developing, changing. Um, so it's, it's transforming that experience into knowledge. It's that process that we go through. Um, and then from that, we can make improvements in the future. Right. So, so it's very important just for our development um, to give us more insight into, we come back to that idea early on, who, who are we as coaches? To give a bit more self-insight, self-awareness. Um, you know, why am I doing what I'm doing? You know, you're really questioning yourself. You're not just, um, it's the opposite of, of going through the motions. It's the opposite of being robotic about your coaching practice and just turning up week after week, season after season and churning out the same thing. So reflection is something that is stimulating that, that improvement and that growth. Um, you know, it can be done many ways, which however you engage with it, you know, some people love to write things, you know, I'm, you know, I have to take notes on it and write it down. Some people, it's got to be social to, it's a conversation with somebody about your experience and you know what they ask you might trigger certain thoughts you know other people you know use video as well you know which is a initially i found it very awkward you know you watch a video of your coaching and it's like wow i don't sound like that i don't talk like that but that's really powerful as well to to, to trigger it so there's lots of different methods um but really the process of it is how it's the questions that you ask yourself um, you know, this is you know, the recent work that I've been doing with colleagues is um, what's your reflective process in terms of what questions do you ask yourself? Um, and, I've, you know, I've, I've overseen many undergraduate sports coaching practical assessments. Um, and usually what I say to them is after they've, you know, they've gone out there and they've coached the group and, you know, I've been, you know, writing some feedback for them. And I'll say, I'll say something like, oh, so how do you think it went? Um, and straight away, they'll probably jump into what they did wrong. You know, and that's their process. It was, I thought it was okay, but I could have done this. I should have done this. I could have done this. Um, so that's their reflective process. Uh, so it's interesting to see before I even ask them any questions, you know, where do they, you know, where, where do their thoughts go with it? Um, mm -hmm. A colleague of mine, um, Professor Tony Guy, um, he came up with this um, quote. I think, I, think, I think he came up with it. Um, uh, or, he, or he paraphrased it, which I, I really enjoy. And he said that, um, you know, we grow in the direction that we ask questions. So if I'm always asking that question of, oh, what did I do wrong? How could I have changed that? Or, you know, um, how can I correct that error? Then we always become about, you know, fixing errors and correcting mistakes. Um, and that's important. Don't get me wrong. That is, that is key. Um, but also we've got to ask ourselves, you know, well, you know what was good about that? Because actually... I probably don't notice the things that went well. I probably notice those standout things that went badly. So what was, what was I good at? What would I want to lean into a bit more? Uh, what did I do well? Because reflection is more than just evaluation of a session. You know, sometimes before people get that idea of reflection, it becomes more about evaluation. Oh, the players did this, but I wanted them to do this. You know, it's, it's actually less about the players and more about you. Um, and obviously it's, it's, it's interlinked. Um, but it's more about having that introspection and what did you do? Um, why did you do that? What were you thinking at the time? You know, 
how can you do it differently? Maybe there's a strategy for that. But also taking, you know, taking notice of the good stuff as well. And that's why speaking to somebody else about it can be good because, you know, often people say, I'm my own biggest critic. And I just think it's a lot of human nature that we tend to the negative. I think in that case, when I'm talking to students, they want to get the criticisms across before I get them out because they think I'm going to tell them all the things they did wrong, right? Because I'm grading them. But they kind of get in there first and say, yeah, I did this, this and this. And then I come in and say, oh, actually, you did this. It was, you know, that was quite good. So I, I think it's a lot of human nature that we, we tend to the negative. So whilst reflection is really important to help us correct mistakes so we don't keep making the same ones and uh, we learn from those, from those failures and we can process that failure um, and deal with problems. It's also important to ask ourselves questions around what are our strengths? Um, what are we good at? You know, who am I as, who am I as a coach? Um, how can I make a strength something that I do more of? And, you know, a strength can be something that we still improve. Um, you know, I wrote a chapter on it recently. Um, and one of the analogies that I gave was um, as a player, if I've got somebody who's a centre midfielder, they've got great vision, great passing, you know, they can dictate the game. Would I work hours and hours on their heading because they're not very good at it? You know, probably not, right? just say this is what you're really good at you've obviously got to have a basic level of all the skills um but then you're going to recognize and a coach is going to recognize what your strengths are and this is what you're good at these are the things you're really good at and that's what i want you to develop um you know versus if we only ever correct problems then we never we never really get to develop our identity as a coach we never get to identify identify our philosophy and develop that because we're just attending to all the different things that are going wrong um, so yeah, for me, it's it's very important for that reason. Um, it helps us grow and develop into the in, into the coach that we can be and reach our potential, um, as well as starting to you know learn from those from those mistakes and, and process failures. You mentioned that as humans, we reflect and focus on the the negative, and we kind of maybe overthink what we could have done better. How how could we have um, done the session differently, etc. How do you, how do we make reflective positive then? If that's a key issue within the process of reflection, how do we change the mindset of looking at the positive rather than I could have done more? Yeah, that's a good question. I think it, I think it, it takes time, and I want to I want to start by saying that reflection isn't necessarily always good. There's a thing certainly in the coaching literature, and you know, as I say, it's a bit of a buzzword amongst amongst coaches and educators. You know, reflection is not always good. Sometimes it's good to just drop something. Like you know, I had a, I, you know, I did a lecture the other day. It was terrible. You know, five people fell asleep. It's probably better that I just, I just forget that one, right, uh, and move on. Maybe, you know, maybe it was a time to trigger reflection, but maybe it's time to move on because reflection is also linked to something called rumination, which has more negative impacts. Um, and a study that a colleague of mine. Dr. Martin Turner, he was involved in, has found that um, reflection is linked to rumination. And rumination, it's similar, but it's this idea that we, you know, we, we just can't stop. We fixate on it. So we make a mistake as a coach. And I was, I, I was terrible for this. You know, and it's, um, you know, it's probably the least enjoyable part of the job is, you know, we'd make a mistake. Maybe we'd say something. Maybe we'd snap at somebody. Maybe we'd make a bad decision. It cost us a game, whatever. You didn't deal with something how you'd like to have dealt with it. And then you're up at night thinking about it. Um, you know, I spoke to a coach here for an interview um, for some research, and, and she'd said that um, reflection was almost an obsession, and that it was it was a, it was like a wheel that was constantly turning, and she wouldn't stop until she had an answer. Um, and I think that's where there's a there's a fine line between reflection and rumination, where we just we, we fixate on a problem, um, and that can be quite damaging. You know, rumination is linked to stress and anxiety. Um, so yeah, reflection is not necessarily always a good thing. You know, it's not. It's not that we should reflect on on everything. So coming back to your point around how do we develop reflection on on strengths and positive aspects of performance? Um, you know, again, that's the conversation that we have with ourselves. So we could have prompts. Um, you know, I used to write on. So I'd write my session plan down, my little um, match day plan. I'd write my session down or my match day, you know, line up and the key points I wanted to get across. On the other page, I'd write down the points that basically a bit of evaluation of it. You know, what what do I need to change? But maybe those prompts could have been changed to 
um, you know, what was strong about today's performance? Who did something good that you can then mention at the next practice? What was it about your behaviours, you know, as a coach that, that you liked and that you would like to reinforce and do more of? So it comes back to the questions that we ask ourselves. Um, and again, also questions with other people. So as, as coaches, when we're having a reflective conversation, we, which is basically we're talking to each other about an experience so that we can learn from it. Maybe it's a mentor. Maybe it's something that's completely unstructured, you know, un, you know informal. Um, that We're asking ourselves things, you know, we're asking each other questions about, about the good stuff as well and try, trying to identify what do we want to do more of, um, you know, what, what went well, um, you know, and, and building more on that. Do you, do you ever find yourself falling into those traps or have you found a coping mechanism around your process around coaching? If that makes sense. And I, yeah, and no, it makes sense. And I think I'm still working on it still, you know, that's something I'm still looking at because as you say, you, you could, you can do that evaluation and, and you can go over those thoughts, but you know, they might be directed more towards the result of the game and to the, you know, into the, just the performance of the weekend rather than, developing as a coach as you say so um I, you know I, I think that's where working with mentors and, and having those conversations with, with others is, is really powerful you know for me I had to, I had to write things down I would I would stay awake at night you know thinking about mistakes thinking about things I could have done better um but then I found that if I'd write it down or I'd strategize and think about you know what I could what I could have done differently. And then if I write it down, right now I can, now I can sleep or now I can move past it because, because it's on the page, you know, whereas I think if I didn't go through that process and other people might have a different process of doing it, you know, and sometimes I'd even just use the, the notes function on the phone because it's, it's right there. And I've got some, um, I've got some prompts in a, in a kind of a notes folder um, that, I, that I can address. And just by having it in there and going through that process means that I can move past it. Um, and again, it is a balance, like you say. It's yeah, you've got to you've got to think deeply about it if you can if it's going to lead to improvements. But then also to get stuck on that same wheel of going over the same mistake, well, that's not really going to lead to progress. So um, yeah, I think it come back to speaking to others and also figuring out what those those prompts and those questions are that you can ask yourself, whereby you can you can you can move past it rather than fixate on it. And, you know, but, but in a way where you can you can get that that critical, that deep thinking. So final question then, Martin, and a bit of a, an overview of everything you've presented today. If you could maybe go back to the beginning of your coaching journey, um, what advice would you give yourself knowing that what you know now? Um, I mean, it, yeah, it's probably similar advice I give to most young coaches or, or students. Um, it'd be to seek out opportunities rather than wait for them you know and that was something that I learned later on um, but again I come back to the idea of aspiration you don't if you don't know what's out there you don't know what the possibilities are you know and you don't know how how, how good you could be or, or the experiences that you could have so um, you know not just accepting things the way they are but get out there seek opportunities um, try and make them happen for yourself rather than just just waiting for something to happen um, again, that was a process that I learned a bit later on, but I think is, is really important for young people. Martin Dixon, thank you so much. Thank you.